All right, welcome everybody to a late June edition of Garden Hour. I am your host this evening. My name is Amanda Bachman. I'm based here at the Peer Regional Center, where it's a little bit cloudy and breezy outside. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers about sort of what's been going on in South Dakota, especially climate wise. We've got Laura Edwards joining us from the Aberdeen Regional Center. Laura, what are you gonna be going over tonight? I'm gonna give a Outlook update uh, that we got just last week and um, kind of look ahead towards the end of summer. Awesome, yeah, I've been driving sort of across the state and back and some places are looking really green and some places not so much. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got for us tonight. And we also have joining us, Dr. John Ball, who looks like it's it, he's in his office on campus. So John, what are you gonna be going over this week? Well, first of all, these are the two days I've been in the office all month. <laughs> I, I live on the road. Well, tonight we're going to cover the insects and diseases you can find in fruit. How's that for an appetizing thing? It explains why your kids say they don't want to eat fruit. All right. And then I'm going to show my rain gauge, uh, which I've already talked to Laura about, but that's that's a good teaser, and it's a great rain gauge. Anyone can use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read the latest uh, tree pest alert, so I think I know what you're going to talk about, but I'm not going to spoil it for folks. All right. And for those of you watching along at home, you can use the Q&A to post a question at any point during our presentations, and then I will field them to our experts at the end of each segment, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. End as well. If you keep an eye on the chat, you can also see the links and information for our garden hotline and some of the other ways that you can contact us when we're not live on Garden Hour. So with those introductions out of the way, I will turn things over to Laura. All right, I think I got my slides up. So here we are kind of at the midsummer point at the end of uh, June, looking ahead towards the last half of the summer. And I'll kind of give a update of where we've been the last month since I visited with you last uh, in, in mid-May and kind of look ahead at, at what we see coming down the pike uh, in the next one to three months or so. Um, so first reflecting back the last 30 days, last month, We've had really some quite warm temperatures, in, in, especially in the eastern part of the state. Out in the hills, um, a little more moderate, maybe slightly cooler for this time of year. That's in the yellow and green dots. Um, the color dots show how different you are from normal for the last 30 days of temperature. And so anything in the oranges and reds are warmer than average. Um, the greens are cooler than average. And so you can see kind of the hot spot of the state was the northeastern corner up in Roberts County, Clark County, looking at eight to 10 degrees above average for that whole month. That's a really, really uh, much warmer than average. We don't see those kinds of temperature anomalies or those departures um, from normal very often. Um, I know we had some individual weeks up in that northeastern corner that were around the 10 to 12 degrees um, above average. Um, last week on June 19th, we saw the first 100 degree temperature readings for the year so far, and that hit in several locations um, from Aberdeen all the way down to the Nebraska border. So um, we have hit 100 degrees at least once um, in, in some parts of the central and eastern part of the state. So yeah, really quite warm. We bumped up, um, I know we've talked about growing degree days and I'll show some graphics about that later, but really accelerating temperatures um, for this time of year. Um, and pushing ahead a lot of plant growth, I know at the same time for those plants that are, um, th that respond to temperature uh, more than anything else. When you look at precipitation, uh, here again over the last 30 days since I've visited with you last, this is looking at percent of normal or percent of average precipitation for the last 30 days. Um, so anything in the greens, blues, purples are above average. Anything in the orange, reds are below average. And you see really just a mix across the state. Um, had I shown this 
this map a week ago, we would have seen a lot of reds and oranges East River and more of a mix towards the West River side of the state with the far west and Black Hills above average. But with all the rain we've gotten over the last week, we had some areas uh, north of Pier in the north central part of the state all the way to the North Dakota border read five and three quarters, six inches of rain over the last week. Similar, uh, some areas down in the south central part of the state. Some hot spots, uh, we had a lot of, um, of weekly totals over three inches in the last week and that's really bumped a lot of people up to near to above average for the last month. So Again, this is a lot of recent rainfall we're seeing, but we still see that southeastern corner lingering on the dry side um, in some areas of the northeast too. Um, it's not uncommon to see this mix of colors in the summer because we see those thunderstorms pop up and, and here and there and, and kind of in a spotty fashion. Um, so it's not unusual to see kind of this mix of colors of dry and wet all over the place um, in the summer season, but just, just knowing that a lot of this has come, uh, and especially in that central part of the state, just in the last week or so. Uh, so looking at the drought monitor, that's kind of where I'm leading to next here. Um, this was published last week before all that rain fell, right? So take uh, just take note of that. Um, but uh, from the reports we've heard and the climate data that we have that we've seen, uh, really the worst impacts have been down in the southeastern part of the state. Not to say there's no impacts anywhere else, um, but we've seen I know a, a lot of areas in the east, um, a lot of uh, crop failures uh, with small grains. I know uh, a lot of gardens have struggled uh, to keep them watered and lawns are starting to go dormant if they're not irrigated. And so um, we've been trying to keep, it, keep in mind those impacts. Um, if you happen to be a Coco Raws reporter, uh, one of our volunteer precipitation reporters, uh, you can submit what we call a CMOR, a condition monitoring uh, observation report. And you can do that as often as you want, maybe once a week if you want to, um, to say, oh, it's really been much drier than average, it's really getting wetter than average, and you can even take pictures and those kinds of things. So if you want to, uh, if you want to share kind of what conditions are like in your backyard, your farm, what have you, um, we'd love to hear those those reports um, if you're a Kokoroz reporter. So looking out ahead, um, oh, back to the drought monitor, I should say, I will. I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of improvement um, in the map here uh, when this map is published next this coming Thursday morning um, because of, of all the rainfall that, that we've seen in, in a lot of that central part of the state, especially in some western areas. So uh, keep in mind that map does get updated every week. Um, so they try to reflect rainfall or drought conditions as they develop. So looking out ahead the next seven days, um, this is the next seven days total rainfall um, according to, to one model. So it's not um, uh, not always exactly right, but it, in general, it doesn't look like a lot of rainfall this time of year. Um, as we get into July, average rainfall is maybe about three quarters of an inch or so, maybe an inch. Um, uh, per week. And so to see, you know, weekly totals and the greens are less than half of an inch. When you're looking at blue, that's about an inch. Purple, you're pushing an inch and a half or so. Um, so nothing really too extreme, extreme expected here um, in the next week or so. Maybe just enough to keep things damp, depending where you're at. Um, as we look out ahead towards the end of that seven day window, so about a week to a week and a half from now, six to 10 days from now, um, we're looking at a little bit of a pattern change coming in. Um, and maybe those of you out west are already feeling some cooler temperatures. Um, you know, as I look at the forecast for Rapid City this week, not even hardly gonna reach 80 degrees. Um, so, so cooler than average for this time of year. And as we look out, um, you know, that first week of July, that's kind of what we're looking at. And you look at the map on the left, uh, 
below average temperatures are favored for that period of July 3rd to 4th, so right after, right over the July 4th holiday. Further east you go, maybe leaning towards warmer in the far east, but um, really looking at the west uh, towards the cooler temperatures. And on the precipitation side on the right map, um, you know, area over the, the Northern Rockies there favored or, or leaning towards wetter than average again in that similar in that same period. So it could be a little period of active weather there, um, you know, early ne early to mid next week. Looking out then a little further beyond eight to 14 days out, um, we continue to see that pattern with um, temperatures leaning on the cooler side, um, kind of centered over Wyoming. Uh, which kind of which includes western South Dakota um, and statewide uh, you know kind of favoring a more active weather pattern there with with more chances of precipitation for that week of July 5th to 11th so um, that one to two weeks from now so uh, looks like the heat is going away for a little while and maybe more chances of rain and that's also what we see for the month of July in general. Um, this was uh, the outlook for July temperature and precipitation that was released June 15th. I will say these maps uh, will be updated um, afternoon on Friday, on June 30th. Um, so at the end of the week here. But you know what I'm seeing in the next couple of weeks, this is pretty consistent with um, with, with what we see coming in, in the next two weeks. So I don't think we'll see too many changes, at least not in our part of the country. On the left there is temperature, equal chances of uh, cooler, warmer, or near average. I'm wondering if they might lean on the cooler side out west, um, given what I just showed you, but I don't see particularly any warmth, any hot temperatures like what we've seen in the last month. And then on the right, uh, chances leaning towards wetter than average for July. So again, I think we have some good chances at least in the next uh, one to two weeks and uh, cross fingers that that can continue. So we don't have to work too hard for our gardens, but might need to check for those weeds and be a little active uh, picking weeds um, if we do get some more rain there. And then the three month period, July through September, um, we look at a very strong uh, El Nino uh, pattern setting up. Um, for the month of July, um, you know, we see the ocean really behaving like El Nino, but the atmosphere um, and our jet stream patterns haven't quite lined up with that yet. So, but as we look towards the later summer into fall, we look like that is going to change. And so, um, we don't talk about El Nino too much in the summer and fall. Typically, it's something we focus on more in the winter season, but this is a really unusually strong El Nino that's developing. So um, it is a conversation piece for sure that we've been talking, that people ask me a lot about. And here um, on the left there, temperature. El Nino late summer doesn't really lean warm or cold particularly and so you see that influence there equal chances of warmer cooler or near average for for temperature on the precipitation side um, historically in El Nino years we do see a leaning towards wetter um, conditions across much of South Dakota and that's what you see on the map there and that wetter signal kind of lingers into October um, before that kind of fades away. Um, so something to look ahead and maybe think about um, as you're planning for, for the end of your season. I know some of you may be looking at maybe planting some cover crops or those kinds of things. Um, might be a good year for that given the amount of moisture or the leaning towards wetter conditions. Um, might be something to try this year if you haven't tried it before. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, that part and um, I did have a little bit to share with Growing Degree Days, if we have some more time there. Yeah, you go ahead. Keep going? Okay, all right. So here is a tool um, that was developed, oh, maybe eight to 10 years ago um, from this group, this project that was called Useful to Usable. Um, it's called the Corn Growing Degree Day tool, but it's, 
uh, base 50 temperature. So you can use it for a lot of things. And um, when, you, when you first get into the tool here, I'll go back a little bit here. Um, there's a map of every county in the Corn Belt, um, in the Corn Belt state. So you can zoom in on South Dakota and click any county here and get data updated every day um, on growing degree days. And so I took a snapshot here for uh, Brown County. And let me see if I can um, make this a little bigger for you. Okay. Um, so I took a corn planting date of May 15th. You can say any crop, any, any plant that you want, um, uh, a planting date of May 15th up here. Um, and it looks at average growing degree days compared to this year. So for this year so far, looking at my key here, um, that's the green line. You can see this green line has really, really had a steep curve. So as of June 20, um, June 20, let's see here, 6th, we have 847 growing degree days already um, since May 15th compared to the average of 637. So we're about 200 growing degree day units compared to average and compared to last year. Last year was pretty much right on, right on average. Um, and when you, if you want to compare to a bunch of different years, you can look down here, it gives you the top three years that are similar um, so far, and then for that county, and then you can go back in time all the way to 1981, sorry, um, all the way back to 1981, um, if you want to compare some other years. Um, if you are growing corn, it's a neat thing to do. You can look at um, the red line is the date um, uh, that they anticipate silking, black line, uh, is the date here that you would anticipate black layer. Um, these blue lines are interesting. These might be good for gardening too. Um, these are the historical freeze dates, all these blue lines with the, t um, the average date being the tallest, thickest line here. So a lot of cool ways to look at growing degree days. Um, and that's for Brown County. I also looked at, um, I think this is Minnehaha County, I think. Yep, this is Minnehaha County. Um, about 800, so about 900 so far for the season. Um, average is about 750, so about 150 um, ahead of average. Again, this is from May 10th, starting in May 10th. So you can change the date back to April 1st or something like that too. Um, and so kind of a cool thing to turn to um, try out and I'll put the link in the chat for you guys because um, it's kind of a funky, a URL, so it's kind of hard to find unless you search it. But um, anyways, a, a neat way to look at growing degree days um, around the state. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. And I think I did find the link and throw it in the chat while you were demoing that. So yep, that looks if good. folks have questions for Laura, she'll be hanging out with us for the rest of garden hour. So go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. It looks like so far the questions we have are for John. So you're off the hook for the moment, Laura. And if there's any other tools or resources you want to share from your presentation, feel free to drop those in the chat. But I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, we are starting out with grasshoppers this evening. I feel like it's been a hot minute since I've been on garden hour. I think I did the recording um, earlier in the month and I recorded that like almost a full week before the actual episode. So it's nice to be back with everybody. And if you've got questions for me, feel free to throw those in the Q&A and I will take a look there. But really the big sort of insect that we keep getting calls and questions about are grasshoppers. I was out um, at the Badlands last Monday um, down in Sage Creek and there were just grasshoppers everywhere. You can see I had some dead ones on the grill of my car, but I actually had a fair number that were hitched to ride with me the whole way into town, into Wall. I wasn't going fast enough for them to um, be sort of sheared off of the front of the vehicle. So there are a lot of grasshoppers, especially out in the western parts of the state, but there's also, as Laura's map showed, there's been a lot of moisture out there. So there's currently a lot of green stuff for them to eat. So just because you may be in an area that has a lot of grasshoppers, they might not be sort of a threat to your garden. If things start to get drier in your area, that is when they'll sort of move into whatever left that is green. But if you've got, you know, green road ditches, you know, 
green areas around you, you know, you can scout for the grasshoppers, kind of keep an eye out on what they're feeding on, but there's just because they're there doesn't mean they're going to be sort of chowing down on all of your garden plants. And I did link our grasshoppers in gardens article that was featured in the um, garden and yard newsletter this week. Um, they can be really hard to manage in gardens, which I know is why some people get really concerned about them. Um, a lot of the products that you would be spraying on grasshoppers are things that are going to be, you know, harmful to pollinators as well. So you don't want to be, you know, spraying these products when you've got flowers blooming, because um, then you're not going to get, you know, your zucchini or tomatoes or whatever. So keep an eye out for the grasshoppers. You can do uh, treatments around the perimeter of areas. Um, and if you're in an area where you do have a lot of them, you do need to sort of have like a coordinated effort you know, with you and your neighbors because grasshoppers will move long distances. Um, they are a really mobile insect, and so that's also what makes them a bit of a challenge to control. But um, the the bait, um, I think it's like the nematode or bacterial bait that is usually available, um, is actually out of supply this year. Um, the company that makes it sort of had a catastrophic failure in their um, rearing colonies and it's not available this year. So we have sort of one less tool in our toolbox um, to be dealing with grasshoppers. So keep an eye out for them, keep managing, you know, in the sort of perimeter areas. And as long as you've got green stuff around, um, they'll have something to eat other than your garden. And I did also want to share with folks that I successfully took my monarchs from teeny tiny little caterpillars um, to actual reared out adults that I released um, in my backyard. The last adult emerged, I want to say like last Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I had the five, five chrysalises and they all sort of made their way out and I've occasionally seen a monarch butterfly or two still flying around um, the milkweed in my yard. So we'll see if I end up with, a, or if I can find a second generation of caterpillars, but do know that monarch activity is still going on in the state. So if you've got milkweed um, or if you're out hiking, you know, flip over some leaves, look for the frass, see if you can find any caterpillars. Um, if they're out in a park, leave them be. If they're in there, if they're in your backyard, um, you know, they're very easy to rear out and you just want to make sure you have some sort of like enclosed container um, for them to make their little chrysalis because they will wander and you don't want to end up with a cocoon somewhere in your house that you can't find. Um, but yeah, so that was a fun, my fun little uh, early, early summer insect pets. And we did just recently have the first West Nile virus case reported in South Dakota. It was in Sanborn County. What's kind of interesting is that we haven't had any positive mosquito pools. So different communities will capture mosquitoes and then sort of test sort of a big bunch of them together. That's why it's called a mosquito pool. Um, but we haven't had any positive pools yet, but we have had one human case. Um, so I included the graphic from the South Dakota Department of Health their sort of little prediction dial for West Nile virus cases in the state. This year, um, the little dial is pointing in between low to moderate, um, and they do sort of update their predictions as the season progresses. Uh, but as Laura's update showed that, you know, we've got some sort of increased chances of precipitation across the state. So do make sure that you are, you know, keeping an eye on your yard, removing any areas of standing water. So in my case, I've got some coolers outside that need to be scrubbed out. And I keep making sure that I kind of like dump them out or tip them over um, because we've had a few, a few thunderstorms here in Pier and they've picked up some water. So make sure that you're removing any standing water, change out the water in your bird baths. If you've got those water features, like I said in a previous edition, you know, get those BT um, mosquito dunks, throw them in there so that you're you know, managing any mosquito larva that might be hanging out in those areas. And as we approach the July 4th weekend, um, make sure that you've got your sunscreen handy and also your insect repellent. Um, these, the vector mosquitoes for West Nile virus are most active from you know, dusk onward. So when you're out watching the fireworks, um, do make sure that you are you know, wearing insect repellent because that's kind of a, a prime weekend to get bitten by mosquitoes and then also possibly um, contract West Nile virus. So make sure that you are staying safe out there uh, for multiple reasons. And since Tuesday is July 4th, we will not be on garden hour um, next week. So if you've got your questions, make sure you ask them tonight. Um, 
but yeah, you'll be able to enjoy the holiday with your family and friends and you won't have to worry about missing us live. I did want to throw in sort of one of the cool insects that I've been seeing. Um, this is the grapevine beetle. It's Pelidnota punctata is the scientific name. And it is a sort of bigger than usual June bug kind of creature. Um, so you may have seen these before and just thought of them as sort of a different kind of June bug. And they are another scarab beetle. So they are sort of closely related. These guys have been flying around my backyard, especially now that we got that about an inch of rain over the past week in Pierre. I think the soil was finally like moist enough that they could escape. Um, so I have noticed quite a few more of these flying around. If you have a back porch light on or anything, these are some of the insects that will absolutely go flying for your porch light. You don't need to be alarmed. Um, the larva of these will feed on um, like rotting out wood, you know, decaying stumps, stuff that is really like super far gone. They're not going to be a pest on, you know, healthy tissue um, as far as when they're in the in the grub stage. So they're not something that we, you know, recommend any sort of management for. It's just an insect that you're going to be seeing out there. Um, if you do have um, grapevines, um, any of the vitus um, species, the adults will nibble on some of the foliage, but their life cycle takes two years. They spend most of their time as a grub and they don't really emerge in sort of large plague-like numbers. So they're just kind of a cool, really big uh, scarab beetle that shows up in backyards pretty commonly in South Dakota. So if you see one of these flying around, now you know what it is. And you may be seeing sort of more interesting insects in your yard. Um, if you're somebody who is, you know, gardening for the pollinators and, you know, adding some more of those native plants that I know Christine and her grad students have talked about in previous editions. Um, and I just wanted to share that for those of you who are worried about your like landscaping choices, if you're making some of the changes towards, um, you know, some of these habitat um, habitat gardens that your neighbors might be grumpy. Uh, don't feel bad. My neighbors are grumpy too. Um, I got a really super pleasant letter over the weekend and I decided, oh, it should be time that I put out some habitat signs to sort of educate the people walking around my neighborhood why my yard looks the way that it does. Um, so there's a couple different programs um, and you can kind of go through and there's even more than probably what I listed here. These are just ones that I'm familiar with through the work that I've done with not only SDSU Extension, but also with um, the Master Gardeners and the Master Naturalists. Um, but there are some sort of like ready-made signs out there that you can get. They're really nicely designed, really sturdy. Uh, you can put them in your yard. They have little QR codes on them so people can um, sort of get more information about the programs you're participating in. But one of them is the Homegrown National Park um, Project, and that was started by Doug Tallamy. So those of you who maybe are from more eastern part of the country may be familiar, familiar with Dr. Tallamy's work. Um, he's really big on, you know, adding oak trees to a landscape, but it's kind of hard to be an oak tree in South Dakota. Um, but his homegrown national park initiative is to try to get sort of more patchworks of natural areas throughout the, um, you know, continental U.S. and also Alaska and Hawaii. So there's a there's a sign for that one, and then also. Monarch Watch and the Monarch Joint Venture. If you're somebody who is really into butterflies and monarch butterflies especially, um, Monarch Joint Venture has a couple of really nicely designed signs um, about native pollinator habitat, about native plants, about bees. So you can kind of like pick and choose which one uh, matches your theme. But I figure including some more educational materials in my yard is you know, something I should be doing. Um, <laughs> So people uh, get a little bit, maybe more understanding of the copious amounts of milkweed that are currently inhabiting my lawn. So that is what I've got for you folks tonight. I saw that there were a couple of chats and questions that came in. And Laura also threw the um, Mesonet link into the chat. So we've had a couple more weather stations go online. So definitely check that out. Um, to see if there's one in your neighborhood. <laughs> the question, what were my neighbors upset about? There was actually a long list of things my neighbors were upset about, um, but uh, backyard composting and my plants were on two of the things on the list. So um, I've been reading up on ordinances. It's been a good time, um, but yes, I will continue to be rearing fun things out in my yard. 
Um, it looks like we've got, <laughs> I know, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a great letter. There'll be a dramatic reading at some point when we're not recorded. Um, <laughs> but we've got, let's see, got a question. Is it too late to plant corn in my garden? And we don't have any of our uh, sort of more we don't have Christine or Rhoda on with us tonight. I would say, so using that corn growing degree day tool is going to depend on what kind of corn you have and where you are in South Dakota. Um, because depending on the corn, if it's got like a shorter days to maturity, maybe you could eke it out. But we're almost to July. So I'm going to say that like, unless you're in some sort of secretly tropical location in the state, you're probably not going to get to full corn maturity. You know, I, I'm in Brown County and I have planted corn this late, mostly after the deer ate the first round, Yeah, <laughs> you know, that I planted Memorial, you know, on Mother's Day. Um, but I would say, yeah, we're kind of pushing the end of that window. But yeah, like you say, get a short day, you know, short maturity, sweet corn and, and it'll probably yeah. Still work. Yeah. Yeah, short, short, short days to maturity and then hope for a late frost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then yeah. not be trying to, I don't know, grow it in like custard or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, let's see. Next up, we have John Ball. And John, there are two questions for you right off the bat. I don't know if you want to take those first or if you want to go through and take them at the end. I'll, I'll take them at the end. What the heck? Okay. All right. We will hold those until the end of your presentation, but I will turn it over to you. All right, well, I'm gonna share. Come on. There we go. All right. Well, uh, hey, everybody, it's been about a month since I've seen you, at least on this. I, I live on every highway in the state. Uh, so I've seen everywhere. And yeah, this state is remarkable. Uh, I can go to places which is dry as could be to areas where it has rained on me the entire month. And I have not been out in the Northern Hills once in the past month that it hasn't rained on me, at least part of the time. And it's been cool. And by the way, anyone wants to take a Sunday drive, leave from Rapid City and go all the way down to Porcupine. And that road's a pretty road. It's, it's hilly. And then we've got all these nice little uh, draws with pines and that. I mean, it can be real pretty. It looks like Ireland, honestly. Uh, I've never seen so much green, and I'm colorblind, uh, so that's that's worth a tour. All right. Well, anyway, uh, we're actually ahead of schedule in Brookings right now. The Semfault spirea, it's a nice little shrub, gets about three feet tall, indestructible. We use this in a lot of parking islands because kids can drive over it and it comes back, but it's in bloom right now. And we're even getting a couple of our late summer flowering trees just getting ready to flower. Um, Aberdeen has been fairly warm. Earlier, about a month ago, it was still the frozen north. It was barely moving. But now it's beat out Rapid City, which doesn't surprise me. Rapid City has been cool. And then Sioux Falls a little ahead as well. Now, by the way, SEM is the call of our for this, this particular plant. And it's a gorgeous plant. But... Since you had to listen to Amanda's talk about our neighbors were so, uh, what, not understanding of her need to add diversity in her landscape, I, you know, people are probably wondering, well, what's her house look like? So I thought I'd throw it in. There you go. <laughs> you know, that's a joke, by the way. That's not Amanda's house. <laughs> but nevertheless, Amanda, when you were talking about it, I thought, hmm. Maybe your landscape's kind of like this. I think next time you need to bring a picture of it, in of it. All right. This is my rain gauge. And this is at exit 131 uh, off the interstate. Uh, and it's the wall drug sign. Now, over the years, decades, quite honestly, I've watched that sign sit in water sometimes for years, sometimes the water is almost up or actually covering part of the billboard. Uh, it's that wet. I think the late 90s were that way. I mean, it was almost covering the, the writing on the bottom and stayed that way for several years. And then I've seen it drop. And by last year, it was completely dry. There was no water anywhere. Uh, it was the first time I got to see just what the ground looked like uh and this year it's filling in again 
Uh, and in fact, it's filling in quite a bit. It's almost up to the base of the sign. Um, so my, my West River rain gauge uh, tells you what the uh, drought monitors already told you. Uh, they're not in a drought, not there. Uh, and in fact, the, the rains just keep on coming. Well, a little bit about what's going on. First of all, we do have Emerald Ash Borer out there in the counties to which it's been confirmed, which again is Lincoln, Minnehaha, and Union County. Now, for Lincoln and Minnehaha County, you don't even need to call me and say, John, do you think my tree has Emerald Ash Borer? If it's an ash tree, it either has it or has dodged the bullet for a while, or is probably going to get it within five years anyway, or certainly sooner than that. Uh, in fact, Lincoln, you go through uh, from Sioux Falls all the way down to Canton. I was always within sight of a shelter belt that was infested with emerald ash borer. I mean, they're that common. And then in Minneapolis County going north, um, you go up along the interstate or you go uh, along the Big Sioux River and you can find it all the way up to Moody County, but I haven't found it in Moody County yet, so it's not part of our confirmation. Um, that's what the adult looks like. It's emerald green, so it'd fit in with West River right now. Uh, they're fairly small. You can see that's sitting on my hand. There's a wedding banner, give you an idea of their size. They will sit for a bit. Sometimes they'll play possum and literally roll over and pretend they're dead. Uh, and then if you touch them again they'll flip back over and then may take off from you they fly midday so you might get a chance to see them but uh again if you make any sudden movements they tend to fly away very quickly but uh here's the one that i've been getting a lot of in the last week or two that people have been out picnicking or walking around or that and this big beetle uh by big it's a little bit longer gets kind of that three quarters of an inch and it's wider now by the way this is bupressed uh, one of the jewel beetles and that's fairly closely related to emerald ash borer and, and i kind of appreciate that when people send me pictures as someone did last weekend of this insect saying hey you know what i live in i think this one was from hartford hey i live in hartford and uh, this landed on our picnic table or that is this emerald ash borer no it's not but it is closely related so I give a lot of credit to South Dakotans. Um, our state, usually when people are wrong, it's fairly close. I don't get like other states have grasshoppers and cicadas and everything else stuffed in a vial. So you're doing pretty good out there, folks. But this is not the Emerald Ash Borer. It is a jewel beetle. You can see why it gets a name. It's fairly shiny in that. This one lives in old dying cottonwoods, and we have no shortage of those. Uh, so it's fairly common East River. There's a golden one that lives out in black hills and goes for pine so and it's very very bright metallic uh, and, and very similar looking but again it's not emerald ash borer it's just a close relative that's native here so it's not an exotic not a threat and it lives in old dying cottonwoods uh, so it's no threat to any of your living trees um, the emerald ash borer, as I mentioned, is out right now as we're going around doing our sampling. We're finding a lot of these D-shaped holes where they have exited. We actually keep track of that. We kind of do a little paint mark so we can tell if something's emerged and not counted again. And the importance of that is right now we've kind of hit the peak. We're a little, bit, little ahead of the peak. In other words, the most emerald ash borer adults that are flying are flying now um and late june uh, starting at about 1000 growing degree days about when our lindens are in bloom and they're in bloom in brookings right now and certainly are kind of a little past in sioux falls and certainly past in the yankton area and that so we have a lot of them out they they came out the first flight started right on memorial day we could hit 550 growing degree days and the black locusts were coming into bloom now the peak drops off very quickly and so in early July, when the hydrangeas, the panicle hydrangeas start to go into bloom at about 1300 growing degree days, which actually may come up by the 4th of July this year, uh, the numbers start to decline. And then by late July, we have very few emerging still and flying, but the ones that emerge will live for about three weeks or so. And that's why we always say, 
they're out, some are out flying until about Labor Day. So Memorial Day and Labor Day still are good bookends for us to kind of show the period in which the uh, adult insects are flying. But right now is when you have the majority of them on the wing and going around trying to find trees in which to lay eggs. Now, as I've mentioned to you before, they're lazy. They tend to lay the eggs in the tree they just came out of if it's still suitable host. And mom does have to feed on leaves. She likes an ash salad for about a week before she lays eggs. And so we like to get the trees injected as in May if we can. Why? Because then all the leaves are filled with the insecticide and we're able to kill mom as she eats. We're probably a little behind that right now. We've got a lot of eggs laid already, but still, if you're in those counties and you're concerned about your tree, for example, you do find it in your neighborhood or, or relatively close by, now would still be a good time to treat your trees because that chemical will be taken up and will kill the very young larvae before they do any damage and why they're very small so very easily killed by insecticide so my recommendation is not to procrastinate like we all do in our income taxes but uh, get out there and get it done now call a company remember this is a service you do have to hire if you've got a tree the diameter of the one you see here what you can buy off the shelf is really not effective. You need to use equipment to get it in better and get the uh, rates that, that are really necessary. So this is one where I really recommend people hire the service rather than trying to do it yourself. And uh, from past experience, I can tell you every year, I go out and look at somebody's tree that's now heavily infested and they say, well, what's wrong with the tree? And I say, well, I'm sorry, it's emerald ash borer. You know, it's been in Sioux Falls now for what uh at least eight years probably and they say you know what i've been meaning to get it treated kind of every year they talk about it and they don't do anything until the point is that they've got to remove their tree so now is a still time a good time to call get on someone's list and get it done well what else is going on plum pockets what a plum crop this year look at that I took that over by Kyle. I mean, it's so wet out there. The plums are just amazing. But if you look at that center plum, that doesn't look very amazing at all. That's a mummified plum from last year. Uh, so a lot of plum pockets. Even though it was dry this year, I expect to see a tremendous amount of plum pockets. Why? Because it's wet and we're getting a lot of infection. One of the things you should do is dispose of all those old dried mummified ones. You should have done that in April. So we're a little late now. Uh, they're already causing the infection. So I expect to see a lot more plum pockets. Now, by the way, plum pockets, you know, people say, well, can I still eat the fruit? You wouldn't want to. Uh, it's hollow. It's like eating a sponge. You know, people say, well, can I eat this? Well, you can eat almost anything. It's what it does to you. That's the question. And that's not going to be tasty. Uh, a sponge might be better just thinking um uh, you know so yeah you just lost a crop is a good way to look at it but you know what here's another one look at this i saw this one west river too this is a choke cherry now notice the choke cherry swollen as well now we sometimes get an infection very similar to plum pockets on them but that's fairly rare typically when you see this it's not caused by a disease but by an insect and i've gotten half a dozen samples so far this week so it must be common throughout the state because uh, the samples seem to be coming from just about everywhere uh, and what you'll see is swollen cherries the cherries next to them might be of normal size so it's not going to be the whole stalk and just like plum pockets which is caused by fungus this one's caused by a small midge, a fly, and it will be hollow. Now, the difference here is, and I wish I'd gotten a better picture of this because you can't really see it, but in that cup, it's filled with these real tiny, almost thread size, little kind of orangish yellow larvae that are kind of wiggling. And I mean, if you ate it, one, I wouldn't. 
Uh, two, I don't even know if you'd notice them, but you just ate a lot of little kind of maggot-like creatures. Think about that. So this is another one to just get rid of. And people say, well, what do I, what do I spray? Well, you can't spray anything to get this fruit to come back. You would spray in the spring just when the buds are beginning to open. And nobody sprays. Why? Because you, you, you don't know if it's going to be a bad year or not. Uh, this insect pops up for a year or two and then kind of disappears. Uh, plum pockets tends to pop up and disappear. Now, interesting enough is we don't find plum pockets on our domesticated hair, uh, excuse me, plums. So the toka, the uh, superior, those plums you bought uh, at a garden center and planted in your yard, you rarely, if ever, would see it. It's going to be on the American plums, the wild plums that you find uh, that is still produce excellent fruit. And then you'll find this on the choke cherries. I don't see the uh, midge that often on, for example, North Star cherry or our other pie cherries, as we call them. Uh, so this is going to be mostly a problem for those who are out foraging. And there's a lot of people like doing that. And, and the wild plums and, and choke cherries can be delicious. But this year we've got problems. So you're probably not doing as much foraging as you might. Oh, and then for the rest of you, getting coddling moths, pictures now, and fruit. And look at it. Now, it's a cute little insect. It's got a dark head capsule. Uh, it's kind of small, but where they typically burrow in is at the base of the apple. This apple's upside down, but it burrows in at the base and it leaves all this granular stuff, which essentially is insect poop. Uh, so it has a trail of poop behind it. Now, what's interesting about the coddling moth is it's just tunneling through the apple to get to the seeds. It eats the seeds. And if it just did that, who would care? But essentially, it fills the uh, apple with a bunch of poop on its way. And obviously, all that becomes infected, and you're not even going to cut this out and eat it. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, people say, well, now what do I do? You don't do a thing. Uh, the spray was weeks ago. Uh, fallen apples that contain them dispose of the apples. So you're reducing the population for next year. The other thing I always recommend is make sure that you don't have apples touching each other. In other words, sometimes you'll find a cluster. Uh, quite often, mom will take advantage of that cluster and lay the eggs, not at the base of the apple, but on the side of the apple where it may be touching another apple and they'll burl in in that direction. Now, I'm not quite getting the next insect, but I will fairly soon, and that's apple maggot. Apple maggot sprays really start about now. In fact, last week, so you're not too late. Coddling moth, you're done. Okay, it's too late. I'm not getting samples of apple maggots yet, but in a couple of weeks, I'll get pictures that'll look like this. And they burl into the young fruit. They don't eat the seeds, but they just kind of tunnel through it. Call them railroad worms too, because the tracks they leave uh, to it. But a lot of people spray for this, but they spray in the spring and they say, well, it's always infected. Well, mom's laying her eggs right now for the apple maggot. In fact, after rain, she kind of comes out of the ground and will lay eggs. And so we're seeing a lot of that right now. If you're going to treat for this, which tends to be a big problem in a lot of the state, now's when you're spraying an insecticide to protect your apples. And you'll be spraying that throughout July and even into August, not right up to harvest though read and follow label directions in terms of when you can once the last spray you can make before you harvest the fruit but uh you can end up spraying every 10 days particularly if we have some moisture that keeps driving them out of the ground well i got a couple more slides here and then i'll wrap it up so we can move on to others and that's uh, maples everybody's got a maple that's half dead and you know, i've gotten calls today even from iowa what's wrong what's all the half dead maples Blame our dry fall and long winter. This is all desiccation. Now, by the way, uh, it's not a surprise that it occurs on maples. Some of you might remember back to 2012, we had a similar event and we had a lot of maples. The top half was dead or it was very late and leafing out. So pictures like this are very common. What I tell people is go up on the part that looks dead and look at the buds. If the buds are still soft and plump, it may still break bud. And I've had people who called me and said, oh, yeah, it finally broke bud last week. And I would leave it until after 4th of July. I have seen things leaf out as late as that 
that week, that holiday week. Uh, but if you go out there now and touch it and the buds break off, yep, prune off what's dead or kill the whole tree if not not much is good with it anymore. Uh, we're seeing this on maples. We're also seeing this on walnuts. Looked at a tree in Myrtle last week that had this. Uh, seen a little bit on uh, butternut, which is related to walnut. Uh, a little bit on catalpa as well, but it seems to be mostly maples with a little bit of uh, walnut and just blame the weather. Or Laura, as our climatologist, she's responsible for that. But uh, the other thing is chlorosis. Um, either because it's too wet or too dry, so the root system isn't operating as efficiently as it could. We're looking at a lot of maples that look like this, red maples and silver maples. And I've stopped at people's homes. I said, well, I keep using this chelated iron, and it doesn't completely green it up. What you have to remember with maples is they'll need manganese and iron manganese and iron so you're gonna to have to buy a chelated form of manganese and add it as well now it might be a little too late this year to get a good color change but next year when you're treating your tree you might say okay i'm going to use manganese and iron for a maple you only need to use iron for oaks and birch two other species that commonly are affected by chlorosis and again it's due to the high ph soils that we have so that's it for me i'm going to stop sharing and do I have any questions or? Oh, you have so many questions. <laughs> Other than the fact people want to see your house again. I know they were just <laughs> enthralled. With... <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. You kept complaining about your neighbors. I thought maybe people want to see. And I'll bet if we put a vote today, the people are going to vote with your neighbors. <laughs> Uh, so the and, and by the way, everybody, that is not her house. So don't panic. <laughs> Although... <laughs> If she's annoyed about certain things I'm doing, I'm sure the armchairs would be just an extra little cherry on top. <laughs> I, I will I, I will tell you without divulging location, that was a home that uh, was rented by college students. Say yep. no more. <laughs> yep. I mean, truly, in a college town, the uh, the free sofa, free armchair, like economy, like those all have to go die somewhere. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you are. What yard. better oh. way to end your life than in the front yard? <laughs> <laughs> nice day. You can sit out there at least. Okay. Yeah, anyway, you know, but... <laughs> sit out there, take a break after mowing. It's great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we've got quite a few questions. Um, just a couple here. One about a, I'm assuming Black Hill spruce, because I don't know what else BH would stand for. Yeah. They're using watering donuts. How much water and how often will the trees need water? Oh man, you know what? Great question. But the part I don't know, and maybe you don't either, Amanda, is where are they? If I don't know. Yeah, that's a problem. If you're in the hills, you don't need to do it the rains are that good in fact i'd be worried about overwatering. if you're down in yankton lots of water now did they give the height of the plant or nope okay. they just said they just planted them and they're using the oh. donuts. all right just planted them so i'm going to say it's about a five foot plant 20 gallons a week and kind of divide that up into three waterings but about 20 gallons a week you want to you want to make sure our we're in in that donut you know so you fill the donut you know, give it five or six gallons, then do it again, five or six gallon and five or six gallons again. And, and again, for all you folks that that'd be down if you're in the southeastern part of the state where we are still under severe drought. If you're in the northern hills, don't even bother. Actually, if you're in the hills at all, don't even bother. It's so wet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you're saying about because I yeah, also that drive to Porcupine, I was like, it is so green out here. Like it's I am incredible. It, yeah, it was gorgeous. Um, Also, though, still like hardcore tick central. Um. I pulled a tick off me while I was driving home. So so do I. I mean, it's yeah. always fun driving down the interstate, feeling things crawling on you. I know, <laughs> like I feel something on my body, <laughs> and then I pulled over to uh, get it out of the car because I didn't trust it to not get like sucked back in with the wind. I've had um, that go end up in the back seat. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Oh, apparently the spruce are four feet tall and in eastern South Dakota. Oh, boom! All right, so we hit it. Twenty gallons. Seriously, right. on that one. There we go. Let's see. Next one is <laughs> some more, uh, you know, different kinds of winter injury, but many of their shrubs were completely flattened under the snow load. They've put out leaves and bloomed, but they have them propped up and tied up to keep them off the ground. Should they cut them all the way back this fall? They've got a blueberry muffin viburnum and a black lace elderberry that are flat. 
Yeah, and by the way, those are two very nice, nice shrubs. If at this point in time, I would just have patience. You know, you sounds like you got them tied up. You're holding them together. Next March or early April, I would cut them to the ground. Not fall. And the reason for that is we have an open winter. Those cuts will actually dry out. So in South Dakota, I recommend you wait until uh, about March or April. But next year, cut them, you know, about two inches from the ground. And they'll come back just fine. And since they're summer flowering, they'll still bloom next year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now's the time to just set your little calendar reminder, if you like. Yeah, <laughs> John do, says trim the shrubs. <laughs> yeah, doing it now in the hot weather may not work out well for the for the plant this year. And then we've got a another sort of pruning question. Can they cut down their snowball bush in September? It needs to get the dead branches out. It's an old bush, but it still produces white blooms. Once again, uh, oh, you can cut out dead branches anytime you've got a saw in your hand. Uh, that's not a problem. But since, again, those are summer flowering, I would still wait until March or April. Rather do that. If you said, John, we've got to do it in the fall. Yeah, go ahead. They're pretty tough plants and will come back. But in South Dakota, fall pruning, if we get an open winter, I've seen where those cuts dry up, die back, and you don't get as much regrowth as if you did it in April where... You know, winter's essentially over, more or less, and it's going to start growing fairly soon. Awesome. Well, those are our questions, and we have just enough time to sort of do our final closing thoughts before we head out for two weeks. So we will not be here on July 4th. We will be here on, well, what's 4 plus 7? July 11th? Yeah, July 11th. Yep. <laughs> I won't be. I'll be down in Omaha at a SARE meeting. But yeah, if folks have sort of questions in the meantime, you can always use the garden hotlines. You can use Ask Extension. You can shoot us emails sort of individually if you'd like. But as we go around, Laura, what should people be keeping an eye out for in the next, say, two weeks? You know, yeah, it looks like uh, leaning towards wetter than average, not particularly hot at all. Um, as we have thunder boomers going on right here in Everdeen while I was <laughs> muted. And I know this, there has not been a lot of severe weather uh, really so much this summer, um, but I know it is happening. Uh, we are seeing severe thunderstorm warnings, so watch for hail. Um, and that might be a topic for July to look at potential hail damage and some things, but keep an eye out for that and stay safe. Yeah, I know uh, Spearfish is probably like, we saw hail. <laughs> yeah, I saw some pictures they, today. Yeah, they Facebook. had, they, yeah, quite the storm uh, last Friday as, yeah, as I was like running out of porcupine. Uh, but yeah, John, what's what's going to be happening the next two weeks that people should be keeping an eye out for and not pruning their bushes? Well, you know, and, and I think I pretty much covered it, but uh, I'm going to suggest Laura in two weeks talk about how to take bumps out of your car from uh, hail because <laughs> i i kid you not i mean i'm driving along and they give the warning two inch hail two inch hail <laughs> i saw some rvs that just looked horrible so uh, we'll end with we'll end with her remark and that is just be safe in this unpredictable weather that we seem to be having yeah, definitely make sure that you've got at least two ways to get a severe weather update, especially if you're going to be out on the water over the holiday weekend and wear your sunscreen, wear your long sleeve shirts, and don't forget that insect repellent. So <laughs> that's why I'm going to be everybody's mom. <laughs> we don't want to see any more West Nile virus cases. So have a great holiday weekend, everybody. We will see you back here in two weeks on July 11th. And until then, stay safe out there and happy gardening.